The opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect those of our sponsors and are only those of the individual commentators. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to the Season 9 finale of The Rabin Report. I'm your host, Elliot Rabin, and for the last time with me this season is my expert panel, Christina and Anna. How are you both? Good. How are you, Elliot? I I am good. Christina? Yeah? Are you excited for this, uh, for this season finale? I am. I like the topic. I'm very excited. Well, I am happy to hear that you were excited. Anna, how excited are you? Very, very excited. Like, it's a interesting topic. The moment I posted on my platform, I had already like three friends texting me like, yes, this is a topic that I want to see, blah, blah. You know, we could get more subscribers if we actually do it naked, like I proposed it, but no <laughs> one followed my idea. I was game for it, but, you know, got to keep you it were- professional. You know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm at a loss for words. You know what? If you two want to go and, uh, and be naked, then, then please, by all means. Uh, but before you do, I'd like to introduce our special guest for this week, which is Michelle Correa. How are you, Michelle? How are you? my last name pretty well too did i yeah korea yeah korea oh. usually people say like korea like south korea but no no no, no nuclear weapons here <laughs> no we're not uh, we're not discussing those no. but uh you know thank you for being here why don't you tell us a little about yourself oh yeah for sure so my name's michelle i go to trent university i'm in my master's of environmental science and usually i'm nib- dabble into like a nonprofits such as like youth at risk youth or seniors and the homeless that's usually what i'm doing right now so especially with covid19 we're trying to raise some ppe and stuff like that for seniors in the gta so if anybody wants to help out you know you can dm me and it'd be great that's awesome it's always uh it's always great you know helping out a a good cause and so thank you for thank you for what you do thank you for being here um coming up in 15 minutes we'll be talking about our main topic which is only fans and sex work but first let's take a look at our top stories in our weekly update starting with sing and aoc playing among us so Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP party, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez <laughs> played... Uh, He's practicing. He's doing uh, his best. Oh, thank you. I don't know what I'm practicing for. I, don't, I really don't know, so we're going we're gonna to keep that uh, quiet. So back to the left-wing side of politics. Jagmeet Singh and AOC played Among Us publicly... Um, and it's a popular online multiplayer game, and they did it as a way to reach out uh, to young people because, uh, according to them, that's where they hang. They discussed healthcare and al- other policies among it. What do you guys think about their method of trying to reach out to to young voters, Michelle? I thought it was kind of cringe. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I actually watched a little bit about it. It's it does. I don't think it's very effective in the sense that. The NDP right now, they're kind of losing money a little bit. So They are? Why are they losing money? Because they're going... People who are like Tom and Claire, like those type of NDP and those people that were like, like in Jack, Jack Layden, mm-hmm. are kind of going away from Jagmeet because he's going towards too progressive politics and they just... He's kind of going away from like the union worker and going towards more progressive the young people. Mm. So more of that. And so they're kind of losing donations in that sense. So how does it help that he kind of partnered up with uh, AOC because she has a lot of influence and she, in a sense, exposed him to the American market? 
right? Yeah, I'm exposed to the American market, but it's not going to really help him in the sense for in the Canadian because he's going to need to get some traction votes at the end with Canadian voters and not American. Mm -hmm. The only positive I think here from the Among Us is that he's showing solidarity f across the border with the progressives. Mm. So, especially with AOC, she has like in the United States, there's a lot of people who are against her, right? The establishment yeah. Democrats. So just trying to show that she's not alone in, in her uh, views and stuff like that. But that's the only positive I can see there. Mm. Christina, Anna? Um, I agree. These things can be pretty cringy. I think no matter who does them, it's always a little bit... It's like, you know, that the one um, gif of uh, Steve Buscemi with, like, the skateboard on his back, oh. and he goes, how's it going, fellow kids? Or whatever it is he says. It feels like that, and I, so it's a bit... It could be hard to watch sometimes, but I do think it's a I do think it's a cute idea. The, their minds are in the right place. Um, I don't see it being effective with younger voters in the sense of young, as in our age demographic, but mm -hmm. maybe people approaching the age of uh, being able to vote, people who maybe aren't even voting yet. It's kind of a way to introduce them to these candidates and. I think I think it could be effective if you're looking at much younger age groups. I think we're at an age now where we basically just see it as kind of weird. Um, but I think it could be effective if you're if you're focusing on um, you know like somebody who's 16. Maybe they they play Among Us and they're not sure about who they want to vote for and they're just kind of learning about politics. It's kind of a fun way to engage with politicians. So yeah, Anna. Well, they are left-leaning leaders, so probably they don't have a lot of work to do. That's why they're playing. That's why, no, actually. Wow. I, I actually think uh, that, yes, they are, like Christina said, they're approaching the, the younger demographics. And certainly, uh, one interesting fact of, of that video game particularly is that it's one of the, if I'm not wrong, it's one of the first video games where the character is like an uh, the main character is an lgbt character so i guess that it also goes in that way because it kind of shows like oh you know we're playing this progressive game too and it all connects so interesting interesting perspective but I, I find it also interesting that you said that they don't have much work to do <laughs> why why do you say that it's just me, um, you know, I don't like the left in general. That's what it goes. <laughs> Anna, what about me? <laughs> uh, you are the exception, darling. Okay. <laughs> wow. You are in the good ship. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good to hear that we're not about to have a fist fight uh, in the studio. But let's move on then to our next topic, which is Adamson Barbecue. So... Adam Skelly, the owner, has defied lockdown orders to reopen his Etobicoke restaurant for indoor dining. No masks by the way. He was arrested after defying the orders three days in a row, and he was released on bail with certain conditions, including staying away within uh, 200 feet of his restaurant and not communicating on social media, which is actually where he got his popularity when he announced that he would uh, reopen. Now the restaurant has been the site of anti-mask and anti-lockdown protests, and as of Friday, his GoFundMe that was created to help cover legal costs has raised more than $171,000 from over 3,600 donators. And it's still growing. And people are now calling for that GoFundMe to be taken down. What do you guys think about Adam Skelly and what he did? Some I think it's so annoying. I like la like last week when we didn't maybe know as much it was kind of we had just heard about I think he had only it was the first day that he had um broken the rules mm -hmm. maybe I can't remember exactly but now here we are a week later and he is purposefully being defiant and I understand the frustration for these small businesses um and how this lockdown is affecting them I think we can all feel for them but to be you know, you, you've you been given a warning and then you continue to do it and now you're saying you can come in without masks. It's it's irresponsible and I and I think there was a... He could have started a really good discussion about how we can support small businesses during this time, but instead he made it... Uh, you know, he just wants attention. All it is is about himself. He doesn't care about other small businesses. He cares about his small business. Well, that's that's what a lot of people are saying. They're saying that he had the opportunity to be the voice for small business. And instead, and he was just the, he was just the spokesperson for his own business, and he's being irresponsible while doing so. So it's just, 
I, I don't think he actually cares about the state of other small businesses. It's just about himself. Do you think he has a valid argument, though, in the sense of if Costco's are allowed to be open where people are packed in like sardines, why can't his restaurant be open? Well, like Let I, alone the mask yeah, issue yeah. aside. Like, like, like I said, I think he could have you know he could have triggered a really good conversation like what what can we do differently what can we maybe work around these you know uh these measures and find something that works better for small ben benefit uh businesses that benefits them mm -hmm. but i I, th I think he kind of threw that out the window because he came became self-absorbed with this whole thing um and lost touch with what should have been the discussion I actually just, like I said in the last show that we had about the lockdown, I, I actually said, like, you know what? We are going to have people racing against this measure. We're going to have people protesting against this measure. And this was something that is, was going to happen because people, like, they, many people are not going to tolerate a second lockdown, especially if they keep extending it, it's going to get far worse than this and you know and, and and that is something that he said he said you know i i did the first lockdown i i closed my business but but now the second one no, he can't no, no. take and, and and to be honest like in the end it's all it's all about this police mentality i saw this this article like oh you know people are complaining because they're raising funds for this guy dude if you don't want to to give money to him don't do it but don't tell the platform you need to take it down because guess what people feel identified with that cause and in the end of the day it's not a matter of him opening this uh, defying this order and opening the business it is a matter of government take the right approach don't kill the small businesses in the process yeah yeah especially like with small businesses i know so many small businesses have said that they were living on serb just to have their small business alive which is such a small, like if when you put it into perspective, like that kind of fee or that kind of um, benefit is for an individual. And the fact that they're having to put it towards their business is so upsetting because that's some like the what you're getting as what you're getting is it's not enough to really, you know. No, no but I yeah. mean, like they have like their livelihood, like from like, you know, like, no, they, totally like they have to like. They're trying to support their family and have to try to put whatever is left to their small business just mm -hmm. to like try to survive, pay that rent. Especially in the summer with the federal, we had that federal, how, um, what is it called? Like the federal store, uh, that federal, I forgot what it's called, but like there was like some federal like loan that we give to landlords of commercial uh, landlords. The rent subsidy. The rent subsidy, mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of those uh, small businesses didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And now they just fixed it a little bit right now, but like a lot of small business went, were suffering. And I kind of see the sentiment of like how we need to open. We need to do something. Yeah. I just think that there there should have been like something like he could have been like a spokesperson, right? Being like, okay, I want to help and stuff like that and get rally and other small business, other small businesses together mm -hmm. too, because there's that technicality that like Costco, just because they have essential businesses such as a pharmacy and food, they can be open. Yeah. Like there's a Walmart by my house that has a, a capacity of like 1400 that can have people right now and and since we are on the topic of coronavirus that's our our last portion of our weekly update which is a coronavirus update so we once again i feel like every week i'm saying we hit another record and it's not a good record because we hit 1800 cases in ontario uh over 600 in toronto alone uh 19 cases were reported in thorncliffe park public school which uh is a school so the schools are allowed to remain open small businesses are are to remain closed and even though there was an outbreak there schools are still remaining open there were charges to businesses in york region who were not adhering to proper health measures um, but no new lockdown orders were installed and canada is behind in many countries in receiving the vaccine and today and yesterday there was an, an announcement by the federal government that the Deficit is expected to exceed $381.6 billion with a $100 billion stim stimulus plan included in that uh, to tackle coronavirus. What do you guys think about, first of all, the deficit being that high? And second of all, in terms of the vaccines, there's a lot of progress. And would you take a mandatory vaccine? Or would you take a vaccine? I would take the vaccine after it is tasted in other people of course <laughs> and it's not the russian vaccine i have to say it again but you know just to make clear and regarding the deficit actually that's what concerns me the most like 
what is going to happen? What is going to be the effect of this? How the government is going to tackle that, track down this public expenditure? Where are they getting the money from, actually, at this point? It seems impossible to recover from. And, and It's just getting better every year, bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. So, you know, what is going to happen? In the end, what is going to happen is that it's going to impact the pocket of every Canadian and each one of us is going to become poorer. That's what is going to happen. And that's something that you mentioned on uh, on last week's show, that you don't know where the government is getting that money. And, you know, we all recall when Trudeau entered office and he first promised a modest deficit of $10 billion, then it became $31 billion. Now we are at $381 billion. He's going to use the coronavirus as an excuse in the, la in the next, uh, what remains of his mandate. Like, you can imagine that. Do you think he's handled the virus well, though, in general? I think the expenditure level could have been reduced, to be honest. Like, he's doing things like sending even money abroad to other countries that shouldn't have been done. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, we're... I, when I heard that deficit, I actually had a little heart attack yesterday when I read it. I was just like, what? But it's, yeah, we're going to be poor because when you have bigger deficits, that means how are we going to generate our money? Higher taxes. So who's that going to hurt? It's going to hit the average Joe. It's going to hit the small business. It's going to hit everybody <laughs> really hard. And as, I, as she said previously, where are we getting this money? Who are we borrowing this money from <laughs> to actually do this? And how is this going to affect the pro um the provinces like how is it going to be distributed how this um stimulus package is it just going to go to the places that are more affected by coronavirus or is it going to be evenly distributed and who's going to be left out as well that's like a big thing and also i won't take that vaccine because mm. um it's an it's an mrna vaccine so it's a kind of new type of vaccine which means oh which means is that it takes like the rna of whatever it's coronavirus and pr makes proteins mm. but the problem right now is that They've only tested on healthy people of COVID and that have not had COVID, but there hasn't been any tests on people who might have be immunocompromised or who actually had coronavirus beforehand. Mm -hmm. So until I actually see the evidence of like, there's no side effects for those people, like myself, like I have a little bit of like some health issues, so yeah. I wouldn't want to like risk getting complications onto that as well. So, yeah, well, um, you know, that's, we're, we're going to have to see what happens again because It's going to be a very, very interesting Christmas, holidays, Hanukkah, the fact that we're told we can't go see each other, but we can go, we can go to Costco and Walmart. Uh, but let's move on now to our main topic, which is... Only fans and sex work. Lucky for you, The Rabin Report is free to watch, unlike content on the wildly popular website OnlyFans. Founded in 2016, OnlyFans was originally intended to give fans exclusive access to their favorite creators based on paid subscriptions. However, it became a very attractive and wildly used platform for sex work due to its non-strict content policies, allowing for nudity and other perhaps not always appropriate content or behaviors. A big part of its rise in use is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Regular sex work is not exactly an option right now, and in most parts of the world, especially in Canada and the United States. But hey, girls just want to have fun, right? Or make a living. Same thing. It's time, for, it's time for us to find out. With uh, special guest Michelle Correa, Joining the panel, we tackle the differences between OnlyFans and regular sex work, whether OnlyFans should be considered pornography, and most importantly, does this line of work empower women? Once again, this is our last episode of the season, so if you want to make your voice heard, make sure to comment on our feed to have your thoughts read live on air. Ladies, let's begin. Sex work, what is it? Well, you know, a sex worker is a person who is employed in the sex industry, and the term is uh, used in reference to all those in the areas, uh, including those with direct sexual service, as well as staff and management of such industries. Do you guys support sex work as a profession? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah? Anna? 
Yes. Yes. And Michelle? No. No, you don't support sex work. So let's start with you then. Why don't you support sex work? I just find it as like sex work to be something where it's like, I don't know, it's like demoralizing to women, I believe. Just like there's been cases in the past where it's like there's more empowerment unto the man than into to the woman hmm. because they have they get paid to exchange your services, but like maybe they'll they're oh, sorry they're, <laughs> they're, they're okay sorry so there's like yeah I, I'm not, I don't support it because it's like they have the oh my gosh so they have like the uh, you have like the woman here they they do giving the services but they have to please the man as much as they can. And sometimes in that point, there, some men have some like twisted, twisted ways to exploit their their sexuality, and might be coming out of like abuses, stuff like that. They might hit the woman, stuff like that, or there might be even out of there. There's like also women that have actually have been in the past been abused before sexually, like, right. and, being a child, and it just kind of transition there. And, or other women they're, they're in a vulnerable place and. They find sexual work to be to go towards a, another place, like mm-hmm. as a like, beacon of hope. And it's not for me. It's but not like a really not. Thing. So you don't accept it at all, even if, for example, uh, the women are working for themselves and they're not, um, say, in a sex trafficking ring, or they're not. Uh, they're working for themselves. Let's say you don't accept that either. No, I don't accept that either because it's just a, at an end. It's like something so beautiful, it's, which is sexuality will be exploited in other ways as well. It just goes back to the, the power dynamic into the man and the woman. Like even if they're ta- with them by themselves, they still are prone to those safety hazards that mm-hmm. they have. Christina and Anna, you guys are at the opposite spectrum. Why yeah. do you support sex work and how do you respond to Michelle? Um, I think that there's a lot of different circumstances that might lead someone to um, pursue sex work. Uh, there may be... Um, you, you may be your edu- you may not be like highly educated, so therefore, uh, or and you may be poor. There's a lot of different things that can contribute to it, and it might be kind of an easy solution. And a, a lot of women don't end up staying in the sex work trade forever. Um, a lot of women will eventually move on, um, retire from what it is that they're doing. So I, I don't think it's I think as long as it's legal, so long as it's consensual and that's what the woman wants to do, I don't think it's anybody's responsibility to tell her that she can't do that kind of work. Um, I think a lot of women, there are obviously dangerous circumstances and sometimes uh, women are put in vulnerable positions and it's not good, but there are a lot of women who who are happy to be in the trade and they're happy to, you know, they're healthy, they're safe, whatever it may be. Um, and I think that's perfectly fine. Anna? I don't think uh, sex work particularly empowers women because I think that women can be better than that. However, there are certain women who prefer this because they find it more profitable because in the short term can be profitable and you know in the end that's their decision like and I'm, I'm nobody to go and tell someone you know don't do this with your body don't do this with your i don't know online platforms in the end of the day is their choice would i do it no would someone would, would i wish that to some of i don't know my future daughter if I have one of course not but in the end of the day that's the decision of some other women and that's their you know that's the wheel well what's interesting is that sex work uh, is legal in a sense in Canada although the purchase of the service is not that's so, ridiculous. So it's kind of it's kind of a loophole and um, Jen Clayman who's a national coordinator of the Canadian Alliance uh, for Sex Work Law Reform told CBC that criminalization of sex work means that the informal labor and income that sex workers generate is not recognized as legitimate labor and leaves sex workers without recourse should labor exploitation arise. So what do you think about that? I mean, not only you pretty much can't go to court if something happens, but a lot of sex workers don't pay their taxes because out of fear of the government finding out that they're a sex worker so with that being the case and with it being so popular um shouldn't it be fully legal yeah 
I think so. I think we need to keep laws in place that protect uh, people from being trafficked, um, especially young girls and children. Um, I think there's we do need to to tread lightly. So obviously we don't want to decriminalize everything that has to do with sex work because there are cases, you know, where somebody's being um, they ha- they're being pimped out or they are being held against their will or they're being trafficked. Yeah. So I think in those circumstances, we need laws, but I don't think it should be, uh, I think it should be decriminalized to purchase um, these services, to supply these services. And then that way it gets rid of the shame kind of surrounding it. And these women can begin to pay their taxes and they can become, you know, more, um, active members of society yeah. and I, I you know so long as the woman is it's doing it by her own will um and she's of age i think you know you you decriminalize it and they be they can be they they come out of that that shame and they mm-hmm. can become more yeah more active part of society i think that with that kind of legislation that leaves like a gray area right over there the moment you put that regulation, you're going to create an underground. And the underground is going to lead to more dangerous situations. The underground is going to lead to, to, lead to yeah, more, you know, ex- a risk exposure for, for, for the prostitute in the end of the day. So when you, when you do that, you're not solving the problem. You're un- actually just making it worse. Yeah, there's actually a comment here from, I think it's Diana. Um, probably my sister yeah I think so (laughs) she's got your last name Um, she says if it's legal it would be safer for them yep so I agree with that see sisters (laughs) <laughs> Sisters think alike. Um, you know, one of the things we also have a comment from Marcia, and she says that remember the women wouldn't make any money if the men weren't willing to pay for it. So uh, that's a good one. Back that's true. Yeah, and back. So back to you, Michelle. If men are willing to pay for this and women as well, uh, why shouldn't women? do what they want with uh with their bodies it's kind of you know it's it's in a sense the beauty of capitalism where if there's a problem people come up with a solution and they they profit off of that so why shouldn't this be the same like i shouldn't i don't think you should be seeing sex as a product to sell it's something outside of that like it's something that's usually just used for reproduction and some or for people who love each other who's like times well not something to like just sell off it kind of like devalues sex in, in a whole other level. That's what I think too. And even with cr- decriminalization too, it doesn't like as we were talking previously. It doesn't help the problem. It helps like the pimps and it helps like the brothels protect themselves and not the the, the um, sex workers themselves because they there's no the sad thing about decriminalization laws is that they don't put any uh, onus onto like the the sex workers themselves. Not onus, but like protection. So the if something does happen there are a few cases that do that that do succeed and they can go into suing or like going towards maybe a client that was bad or maybe a brothel that treated them bad but from there's still that stigma there for those sex workers not even go forward so if there's something like an avenue there that they can actually help protect those sex workers and also like so wouldn't wouldn't legalizing it protect the sex workers not really in a sense because then after it's still the stigma still there there's, there's but, not, not but at d- least they can go to court right yeah but they're not under discrimination as well like that's the problem that sex workers have is that they're discriminated in other aspects of their life not just for being so, a sex worker so sex they're worker. discriminated because they're sex workers and they may not get a job and and part of it is the stigma you say? yeah not even a job maybe rent a place because you have to prove where you go like when you're mm. renting something you have to prove your face ups and after it's like where the, ah that's true that's so, true so, so it's y- not and, and and that takes us then to to OnlyFans, which is part of our our main topic. Um, OnlyFans is is fully online, so women have full control over this. They don't have to see people in person. Do you think that that is a, a better form of uh, of sex work, and should it be should it be legal? It should be, it's on the internet, so of course sh- you can't be regulating things on the internet. That's the problem because if you start with OnlyFans, you're gonna start with other aspects of the internet. Yeah. So if that part, yeah, it should be legal, like in that sense. But the problem is that the interest it can seize of OnlyFans. So I, I was re- reading the code of conduct and it was saying that they own everything that happens. And I've read cases about like how people have actually taken things off of OnlyFans. I think it was like four terabytes of data from like. Wow. So, like, the company took stuff off of No, like, people took it off. Clients took it off. Or, I was like, yeah, and 
using it for memes and other things and and there was no protection for the 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 owners of those products they were making so there has to be changes around there as well it's the thing is that when you have a platform like even when it comes to facebook right like if we post a picture on facebook or instagram you have no guarantee like that picture is not going to end up somewhere else as a matter of fact i have a friend who has a facebook and later on he find out because he's a he on top of that that someone opened an only fans account with his pictures from Instagram and oh guess what God. these people were making money with his pictures and he was like this is unfair because I want that money from for me so anyways the point is that they are offering a platform of course you are the product you know when you join one of these platforms unfortunately that's the reality and that's something that we need to assume with social media mm -hmm. I, that's that's true because you know like you said uh, Michelle people can grab stuff off like anything only fans anything you put on only fans is their property but as you mentioned Anna the same thing is with Facebook or YouTube they have access to that um, so in a sense it doesn't really differentiate it from other sites because it's on the internet would you say it the kind of differentiates it because when you put on Facebook it's the same thing if you put something bad on Facebook you're going to get ju judged on your job prospects. Yeah. You're going to get judged by your peers and your community. Same thing with OnlyFans. You're going to be judged by what the product you put on OnlyFans. And you, you're going to block yourself from job aspects. You're going to block yourself from maybe creating new connections, new networking opportunities as well. So it's the same aspect. It's just like a risk you have to take. And you have to actually acknowledge that as well. Mm -hmm. That this is something that... You, know, you might not be like Bella Thorne that makes $2 million or $1 million. But it's because that's the thing with OnlyFans. Like when you look at it, if you're a woman who is going to have an OnlyFans and you want to make money with OnlyFans, then you need to see the pros and cons, right? And the pro can be, okay, yeah, I'm going to make money online by creating this kind of content. But you also need to know that then you're going to be severely judged. That's going to also block certain opportunities for you. Like you need to also like, you know, balance that risk and assume that you are taking a risk by exposing yourself. But a lot of women are thinking that that risk is is a good reward, that they're going to make that those six-figure numbers and stuff. But in reality, that's just a few people making it. Well, actually, it's it's very interesting you brought that up because I was just about to, to mention uh, an interesting stat about OnlyFans, which is as of May 2020, the site has 24 million registered users and 450,000 content creators or performers, as the site calls them. So far, the company has paid out $750,000 in revenue. So would you still say that it's a small a small market? It still is a small market because out of those 450,000 creators, only a small pool of them are making that much amount. Of, the big influencers, the big, some celebrities going into there. Maybe like the average woman or man, because there are men on OnlyFans as well, mm -hmm. aren't going to be making six figures. If they are going to, it's they have to be there for seven days a week. It's not like a nine to five job. It's not something you have and you have to outweigh that part so it's like are you do you have like the mental capacities to to be like i'm gonna expose my body every day for um for my audience men or women and also you have in only fans they also have like uh, the dm system where people can request certain other things so you have to be like can i outweigh am i able to as a person to go to that level with another person mm. to exchange those services so it's something it's it's something that I, I I don't think people should go through because I'm not sh especially with um, depending on your character as well. So it's not I find it kind of like degrading in a sense. It's like you're trying to just sell your body to other people you don't even know, which Chris, is kind of yeah. different than other. Christina, um, no, do you I've, find it degrading? Uh, I think it depends again on the circumstance. Um, I think that. There are, you know, when there's a feature like you mentioned, like there's a DM feature where I think I think men can message these women and ask for customized content. Yeah, you know, there's there's some kind of communication aspect to it. And I feel like that's probably where it gets degrading when you think about uh, the requests that some of these women may be getting, because the Internet is a weird place um, and. A lot of, so I can't even begin to imagine what some of these requests might be, you know, um, things that nobody can even fathom. 
And I think in that sense, you may be put in a position where you're, you're thinking, okay, I can do this video for somebody and I'm going to get $500 for it or whatever, but um, it's going to be, I'm going to be doing something that I don't want to do or that I don't enjoy. So I think in that sense, it can be degrading. Um, but I do think that women, for There's the most part, part should, yeah, no, they sh should entirely be allowed to push back and say, you know, I don't want to make this kind of content or whatever. I think women should have full control over what it is that they're doing. Um, you know, part of the stuff y you talk about, everyone talk about, uh, degrading right but some of the stuff on only fans or these websites is is something as simple as feet pictures pictures of your feet which is you send a single foot picture and you'll get you'll get men sending you 40 bucks for a picture there's no nudity it's your foot yeah I, i've been thinking about that business personally <laughs> but it's a good business venture yeah. it, it is it's a nice side hustle it's a cash job clearly unless it's through only fans and you got to declare it as income but uh but good to know anna good to know that uh, first of all you wanted to do the show naked second of all you <laughs> wanted you want to pursue a foot uh fetish business um i guess i, I don't know if anna's gonna be with the rabbit report for very long she's got a lot of job prospects no you know that i actually wanted to follow up with something that christina said about the dms that this woman get i was just reading an interview that one very like popular only fans creators uh, had and she said that actually one of the things that she enjoyed the most with her fans is the interactions with them hmm. is when they actually interact with them because she said people think that all the men here are sexual predators and actually it is not why because the reality is that in only fans you are not only showing this you know sexual content she posed for example i don't know doing the christmas tree in my home like showing pictures with her husband like it's kind of like a social media interaction too and she say like she feels a personal interaction with her fans. And that's why many men actually select OnlyFans and pay for that instead of going just to Pornhub, for an example. And I think to add to that, I, uh, there was a comment earlier, actually. I think it was also from your sister. She said, um, why pay for OnlyFans when Pornhub is free? Um, now you know, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think there's also an aspect of, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, people, men and women, who get very lonely and they are now being given this opportunity to communicate one-on-one -on -one with um, an attractive person who's putting themselves out there uh, and you can develop some kind of personal communication and relationship with somebody. And I think that that's different than porn because now there's an emotional, personal aspect to it. and. It's more, it's more, the other thing about it is it's more, um, you know, a lot of men. More personal. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of men may see porn as something that they're disconnected from. It's, you know, these women are unachievable, um, but only fancies are real women who could just be an average person like you. And there's something about that that makes it more personable. But, w w you know, yeah, go I ahead. I was going to say, wouldn't that be unachievable too? Because it's like they're paying for the service for instant ratification from women they don't know. That's exactly what I wanted to touch upon the, on, on your side of things, Michelle. And I'll come back to you right now. Kobe says, by allowing this kind of stuff, you are contributing towards a larger issue, a possible degenerating of society. Right. Yeah. So I, I would, I think, call it simp culture. <laughs> In a sense, it's just like you're paying for a service for a, a woman you don't know, that maybe is who in a different province, different state, different country from you. And you're paying for that service, and you think you're in a. Rela Some people m usually think they're in a relationship with that woman, and if well, they yeah, and then that can get dangerous. There's that case of the, that man, Grant Amato. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that case. He basically just got obsessed with this cam girl, and spent like two hundred thousand dollars that he didn't have on her, and ended up being a murderer. Big whole story. Anyways, um, th it can get scary because some of these men, like let's say they are super disconnected from the rest of society, they might get pulled into that and kind of lose sight of things. So yeah, yeah no, I know. I I, I under just to add to yeah. that, it, it is a, it is a bit of a scary. Um, when you Place. look at it that way, I yeah. find another concerning part of uh, of OnlyFans. It's it's not like 
For me, the issue is not more like it's not more like the sexual content of that. Is the entire influencer kind of thing, kind of pool that you can find not only in OnlyFans, you can find it on Instagram, you can find it on Facebook, and it's also something that is not impacting so much women of my generation. It's impacting like teenagers, like many mm. teenagers. They are like I don't know, wanting to be influencers, like when they are super young and you know that that develops like kind of behavior where the more attention you get is where your value increase and if you are taking that as a as a as a measure of success when you are like 16 15 years old that can become dangerous because these girls are going to see that much of the attention they can get they can do it by sexual things yeah and i and to add to that you'll you see a lot of young influencers like on instagram uh these women within the past year have all started have all opened up these only fans accounts uh and there are people who already have these big followings and they're already getting tons of money and tons of attention on instagram and then they're like hey i can take it up a notch and get even more of that with OnlyFans. And that's something you're seeing with like very po like celebrities. Like the fact that Bella Thorne was on it for a day and made like $2 million. And, that's another story. And that's something that I we want to talk about because. But, yeah. Oh, sorry. And after you have like other influencers too, like what is it? Trisha Paytas on there. Oh, yeah. And I think she's always been a sex worker though. Like yeah. prior to her YouTube career, she was um, an escort. So I think for her, it's probably kind of a comfortable area for her but it's the but, same thing it just yeah. goes back to instant yeah. gratification on both sides like influencing wanting more likes more everything more attention and after people the clients looking and seeking that attention and it's kind of like a distorted view like for those clients it's like a distorted view in relationships because they think oh if somebody on only fans can talk to me like this maybe the girl i have a crush on at school on campus at work will talk to the same and i can act the same way as well so there's kind of a distortion there that i kind of have a fear of for the future how relationships yeah. are gonna be just imagine being a mom or a dad and finding that you're i don't know 14 years old girl is doing i don't know some kind of sexual dance in tiktok because it's getting her followers like i will have a heart attack oh my god that that's one thing that terrifies yeah. me about having kids you know we were at least avoided that tiktok yeah. generation and that that the this generation of young girls especially being exploited we kind of missed it so i don't even i can't even imagine what it's going to be like if i ever have a daughter it's scary I, I think it do you think it's though it's just tiktok though or this comes down to a larger issue of of the over sexualization of children nowadays well, it, it definitely comes down to a whole lot of things. There's this, there's a fetishization of, of young women, you know, uh, the younger, the better, uh, jail bait, whatever it might be, teen category on Pornhub, things that, that are promoting the idea of young women. And it gets to a dangerous spot where you can be younger and younger. And like, it, it, so it, it turns into this thing of like men looking for the youngest woman they can get legally and then mm -hmm. you start to tread on like dangerous ter territory and we have a comment from tamara she said i showed my grandma a video of charlie d'amelio dancing and she asked me why i was showing her porn <laughs> oh, no. my dad actually oh. thought charlie d'amelio was older and she's like why does this little like this girl look like a little girl and she's trying to act like a woman that doesn't why and i'm like this like, is a teenager and he's like she should be off where's her parents she should be off tiktok well, yeah. it's yeah. 2020 that's why well I, girls I, are girls are 12 dressing like they're 18 and acting like they're 25 well i i know men who um you know follow these girls on tiktok or instagram not knowing that they're underage women and i have to be like hey guys just a reminder that girl that you're liking all her photos and her videos just a reminder she is 15 or 16 and a lot of these men don't realize That's because creepy. of the way but the thing is like you have to forgive them in a sense because these are women or girls girls who are presenting in a way that makes them look way older um, they're acting in a way that makes them look way older, the way that they're dancing, the way that they're dressing. And I don't, you know, dress how you want, whatever. But when you're a kid, if you're like, if you're videotaping yourself dancing in a bikini, there's only one thing that's going to come of that. There's only one reason you would do that. Um, and I can say that these girls on TikTok who are 15, who look 30, um, my God, I did not look like that at that age. Mm. I had a single eyebrow. 
Um, you, know, you were Frida. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was Frida. I really was. Um, bad eyebrows, like just all around a mess. And these women or girls, girls, they look like women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's disturbing, and and that's what I find worrying about social media in general. Like, of course, the platform of OnlyFans. Actually, for OnlyFans, you need to be 18 or older. Mm -hmm. But for Instagram or TikTok or well, no, only old people use Facebook right now. So whatever. Alrighty <laughs> then. We're, I mean, we're live on Facebook, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah basically like it's disturbing it's disturbing there actually are cases they've been cases only fans has been kind of good on that part but there have been cases of girls who are like 16 15 trying to go on only finds of fake ids mm -hmm. Jesus. but I and mean, after they keep on going again and again yeah. and, uh, but the th and and that comes down i guess to a larger issue because you don't have to be 18 to access pornography <laughs> so i've been told um <laughs> because there's no there's no um ID, you just log no, on. It's just it like Facebook or Instagram. Top, it says, hey, only enter if you're 18, but we're not going to check. Yeah. You know, and are you, you really mean to tell me, especially young boys who are 12 years old, you know, just going around the internet looking for what they can find. They, they're very creative at, at that age. And uh, they see 18 plus, they're like, mm, yeah, no, you're not checking my ID. I will go through this entire website, top to bottom. I will watch and, every single video on this site. And faking IDs isn't new, right? You know, people no, get into no. clubs all the time to, Which you know, with fake a, IDs. It's crazy, though, because we think about, like, I think about fake IDs and I think about myself at, I've never had a fake ID, but I remember being younger and having friends who did. And it was because you wanted to get a, a couple smeared off ices yeah. from the LCBO. And now these kids want fake IDs so that they can go on OnlyFans. It's crazy. You know, I've, I, I haven't, I don't think I've ever had a fake ID, but I've dealt with a lot of fake people. So I guess I'm a little, okay. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> had to throw that in there. But let's talk about our final portion, which is female empowerment. Michelle, you said that you don't think that this is empowering to women. Um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. In what sense would you want me to expand? On Just OnlyFans. Uh, like, why isn't OnlyFans or sex work empowering to women? Okay, so I'll focus more on OnlyFans first. Yeah. I don't think OnlyFans is empowering to women, as we've talked about before. It's like you're, you're grading yourself towards doing a service that's something that is precious to one person. We only have one body, mm -hmm. and we only have something. So wouldn't you want to, like, save that for somebody like who's special for you and not, like, give it to somebody who's paying it for you it's like you want it's something out of like the love out of somebody's heart that or like your heart and somebody's heart to like be sharing something sexual sexual sexuality doesn't it come down to freedom though if women want to do that like would this come down to kind of a moral argument this is more a moral argument not like for my thing it's like i find that like if i go through natural like the vulnerable protective like the, the strong protective vulnerable von right so like i think in the sense it's like if you're a vulnerable person i feel like you're most vulnerable when you're not showing any clothes or anything like that mm -hmm. so that's true and those people who are clients are they're in a strong uh, position because many of these people on only fans depend on those subscribers so i find it not unjust for doing that because you're exploiting the vulnerable which should be the person who's giving the services and the safety aspects as well in only fans as we talked about the being exploited the, the, the uh, being ex exposed in any sense like can have like a i think it was uh madison like the cheating website like they can leak oh, Ashley from, madison, Ashley yeah. madison where they can like leak out the information so like i'm not sure what only fans asked for their um you know their workers to be doing mm -hmm. i don't know what personal information so you have that as well which is yeah. something i think a new thing new aspect that we have from sex workers because beforehand you didn't have that aspect with uh having a client they didn't they might know your first name but yeah they don't know where you live they don't know your credit card number they don't know anything in that aspect in sense so that's like a, a new thing that i don't know how it's going to happen in the future and with the sex work in, in general and sex work in general i feel like it's a way that people who are very vulnerable that want to go they go in a desperation mm -hmm. and i think there should be more programs to help people who want to get out of prostitution to help i know in the uk they have a couple of uh, programs that help women try to get out of there um give them skills to employment skills so they can get a new job um find a new apartment and stuff like that and also finding women who are in that route of desperation different types of avenues to not sell their body 
Um, there's just one comment I was going to read from Tamar. She said, um, and I, I guess it was directed at Michelle. It says, I love that you're talking about the creator, but not the consumer. Um, if you have a problem with the workers, but not a problem with the consumer watching porn. Hmm. I do have a, a problem with the consumers yeah. watching porn as well. I'm, okay. I'm going to be with that. I don't think. Yeah. So you, you think that the, the creators add to the problem. They, that they, is. It's a problem all around. It's Anna? Do you think it's a problem all around and, and it doesn't empower women or do you think it does? I think I understand the moral aspect of Michelle because it's something that I personally believe too. Like I think sexuality, I think your body, your body is sacred. You shouldn't just giving it away to, to you know, random people for money and that can be, uh, that can have a psychological impact on the woman. However, the reality is that OnlyFans offers an alternative to many women. I would just tell the, the, the case of this uh, influencer in my country, as a matter of fact, who has a Facebook account with hundreds of thousands of followers, which is something that the Raven Report should aim to. But, you know, <laughs> but the thing is that she decided to open an OnlyFans account. And just in one day, she made more than 6,000 US dollars in one day in a country like venezuela where the minimum wage is like one dollar per month that woman is like probably helping herself her family and you know a lot of people and the reality is that what other what other option does she have when venezuela is a country with higher prostitution rate in the colombian border when one woman exposing herself to a man can just be charged Twenty dollars. But what does that do to mental health? Because if a woman considers her only method of income to be naked and vulnerable, how does that affect their their mental well being? I think there's. I think it depends on the circumstance. I think um, you know that you can make really good money on OnlyFans. We've heard these like success stories of, like Anna said, people making more money than I make in a couple months in one day. Like it's it's crazy. Um, not everyone is that lucky though. I think it is kind of, um, seen as a side hustle for a lot of women, um, because I think you can do all of this stuff anonymously. Uh, there's, you know, you don't have to connect your name to your OnlyFans account. You can be undercover. Um, so, but then there's things like, um, you know, I, I think where it's different, like let's say you decide to go into porn, mm -hmm. a lot of these women end up doing porn for their whole lives or for a, lo a long enough time that they make enough money that they can retire young because, you know... So you, do so you don't think OnlyFans is porn? No, no, only... F it depends on the content, right? Like, I, I mean, assuming you're getting naked on your OnlyFans and maybe having sex or whatever it is that you're doing um, for the camera. I, yeah, that's porn. But I, the, what I mean in terms of the difference is because it can be kind of stealthy OnlyFans, it's a bit different than if you were to say go into the industry as a porn star where your face um, and every, and, and uh, you know, maybe personal marks on your body. Cause I'm sure like with OnlyFans, you have full control over what you're showing somebody. So these girls can protect themselves. They can cover their faces. They can leave out, um, you know, indicators like birthmarks or tattoos, whatever it might be. Um, it can be more stealthy. Whereas if you decide to go into porn, you're making a bit more of a commitment because you're committing to putting your face out there, putting like personal marks on your body out there, things that you might not be able to you know, hide from in the future, where whereas OnlyFans is a bit easier to... Um, but depending on the content, you still can't hide it from the future, like Michelle said. Yeah, yeah, it depends. And it's the internet, too. You, you can't know, hide anything. No, of course, and it depends on the content. But like I said, like, if the woman has full control over what she's making, she can keep her face out of it. There's no rule that you have to show your face. She can, like, let's say she has a tattoo on her shoulder. She can be like, mm, I'm just not going to show this one shoulder in my photos because you have full control over what you're putting out there. But a lot of people do show their face, and that's a lot of... Yeah, because uh, that's that's what gets you more money, I'm exactly. sure. I'm sure, which is like, you have to, do I want to play it safe and maybe not make that much money? Or am I going to show my face and make like $1,000 more? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the thing, and, and that happens with 
porn actresses, like they put their face. And to be honest, the porn industry has changed so much that these porn actresses, they become influencers. They get contracts with companies that actually want them to sponsor them. Like porn in the end of the day doesn't become only their source of, uh, of income. They create an entire, you know, they market themselves, they know how to market themselves, and they end up into modeling. Uh, there is this girl, she's actually Canadian, but her background is Indian. Suni Leong, I think her, is her name, but okay. she was a porn actress during yeah. many years, and now she's a Bollywood actress. Just imagine well, that. Well, the same for Cardi B. She was a stripper, and now she's uh, Cardi she's B. A, <laughs> there's a lot. There's yeah. a lot of celebrities, though. Amber Rose was a stripper. Um, a lot of there's actually, a, a, I'm sure you could find it. A lot of women who did sex work before they became famous. Um, so, so this this takes us now to the future of OnlyFans and sex work. Michelle, what do you think the future is? The future of OnlyFans. Yeah, I think it's just going to explode a bit. It's just going to explode right rapidly. Mm -hmm. We're going to have more and more people going on there. It's just going to be how is are those people going to be protected onto OnlyFans that they're not going to be vulnerable to whoever they're going to be, and also the clients. How are the clients going to take whatever they get on OnlyFans mm -hmm. and distinguish that behavior, whatever they do? Some of them are, might be really nice and stuff one night, but let's say uh, some aren't. How are they going to transition that? That's something else that's how, how do we protect these people how do we protect both people in that sense both the consumer and, and the producer yeah, yeah producer because like we don't know like we as we know like we have we have false allegations from the client to the produce like from the producer to the client maybe the client maybe said something misconstrued over text or mm -hmm. and that might be taking something else differently too so we have to figure out how are how is only fans going to fix their code of conduct to make it show because I'm trying to, I was like trying to read it and stuff. Like, I didn't really understand what the be the consequences if you break certain parts of that conduct. So, like, more clarification, maybe in plain language, to know would be mm -hmm. better as well. And, a and oh, yeah, so, and, yeah, and we'll see. And Monopoly, we'll see next of the OnlyFans because I don't think there's any. Um, unless um, somebody can correct me, I don't think there's anything else like OnlyFans. Not something as big, no. I would say. There, there are other sites where you can make like content. OnlyFans isn't the only like. Um, what would you call OnlyFans? I don't. I don't even know how to describe what kind a of platform based on subscription. I yeah, don't know. yeah, so subscription I think, based platform. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there's other websites like other. Um, and camming is a bit different too. We didn't really talk about that, but yeah. there's cam girl websites which are which are a bit different, um, but they are they too have kind of the similar system. Um, not exactly the same. That's why OnlyFans is so popular. It is mm -hmm. very different, but there are other sites where. Um, this kind of content exists. So what do you think the future is of it? Um, I think we're going to start to see more and more women joining the platform because of the success stories. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, I, you know, I'm not, cause I, cause like Anna said before, you know, it's not my responsibility to tell anybody what they can and can't do. Um, you know, if that's the kind of work you want to do, I, I don't, I can't tell you, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I don't want that to be something that women decide to do all the time like I don't want every young woman to be like yeah this is what I'm going to do because I can make money I do want to see women pursuing other things and um, kind of going along with all the progress we've made as a society and you know uplifting ourselves as women and some women maybe making this content is that for them so it's not my place to tell them not to you know what if I looked good if I looked good with my clothes off, maybe I would do it too. Well, and, <laughs> it, it's good you bring that up because one thing that we didn't mention is our polls. Oh, yeah. We never actually mentioned them. And we asked our fans uh, two questions. Number one, uh, would you be okay if your partner had an OnlyFans account? And two, do you support sex work in general? And the results are quite interesting. What uh, What are the results to do you support sex work, Christina? So for do you support sex work on Instagram, we had 60% or 67% said yes, and 33% said no. On Facebook, 38% said yes, and 62% uh, said no. But when it comes to would you be okay if your partner had an OnlyFans, the <laughs> results are... So on Instagram, it was 20, uh, yeah, 28% yes, um, and six or 72% no. And then on a Facebook, it was um, 10 no's. 
So 100% no, my partner can't have an OnlyFans. So it's funny that people will support sex work. But not if it's in your own home. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I was going to say. Like, yeah, I can support sex work now. I would want anyone in my family to practice that. Hell no. Yeah, I think it's... And, I, it's and, a, it's and to be honest, I, I also think that the future, when it comes to the future of OnlyFans, I honestly think that it's not going to be only only fans is going to be like every social media that is going to be a strictly monitor and is going to have more strict rules and why because unfortunately this market also lead to other markets for example child porn pornography yeah. that's a thing human so trafficking I think, I think the thing with with only fans is it does kind of protect us from um, like porn sites, like porn, like the big ones, like Pornhub, for example. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of issues there, um, and mainstream consumption of porn is a dangerous. Uh, it can get you can be treading on in dangerous waters. There's there's uh, women who are trafficked on there. There's there's child porn. Um, so I think that OnlyFans kind of helps us get away from the aspect of child porn because it is controlled by the creator we hope yeah. and um but like anna said i think it also might lead to more protections of this kind of work i think that if you see an increase in this kind of work now there's a new uh generation and a new industry that needs more protecting and maybe we'll hopefully start to see um laws put in place that protect these women all forms of sex work not mm -hmm. just only fans i mean i mean sex work all around um so hopefully and i think we'll start to see more um more protection and yeah. for these women. Michelle, do you agree that this would add protection? I don't think it adds. I don't think it add protection in the sense because we're gonna have new avenues. We might have like maybe some offshoots of OnlyFans, and we'll have the same problem. Mm -hmm. But maybe with sex trafficking, maybe with ch child pornography in that sense, maybe not maybe not on the upper web that we have. Maybe yeah. maybe a little bit deeper in the web. We have that part. And it's just, it's an idea that's, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Just like with everything, we don't really know, but it's just a matter of prediction, right? Yeah, it's a prediction. I just think that's going to get a little bit more worse. And we're, we're going to have, as uh, the other girl said, pe more people, younger girls maybe wanting to aspire to do that. And I don't, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. There's other things we women can do, women and men can do because I, I know we've been focusing a lot on OnlyFans since it's women, yeah. but there are men on there that it's, that's not that shouldn't be the last resort there's other things we can do interesting and we all have talents yeah and we can just somehow we can have a profession or that we'll love that's something outside of selling our bodies and that's where that's where we're gonna leave it uh for today um that that concludes season nine of the rabbin report uh in the midst of a worldwide pandemic we were able to bring you 10 high quality shows. Michelle, uh, yeah, Michelle, thank you. Cause anyway, <laughs> Michelle, thank you for, for being here and for coming on the, the season finale of, of the Rabin Report. Oh, thank you for having me. And yeah, and thanks for being able to bear with me. I'm a little bit awkward, but this is actually the first podcast or facebook live thing ever really done. so yeah i've never done it before so I thought wow. it was pretty well cool. well we're glad that we were able to uh because of the topic de-virginize you on the <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> once again season nine finale who knows if there will be season 10 might as well get it all out today um we'll just get all the puns out exactly okay. exactly see she gets it she, you're coming back you're coming back okay. um <laughs> uh and to all our guests uh, this past season, um, Elvira, Corey, Tanya, Keon, Jake, Nina, Hannah, and Michelle, of course, um, thank you for coming on the show this season and for being a part of our discussions. Jerome, thank you for uh, trying to be a part of the show before the government censored you. <laughs> Anna, thank you. Uh, for taking over as uh, one of our main panelists. You have been incredible to work with and and listen to. Thank you. Also, thank you, Jerome, for being censored by the government. No, I'm just kidding. I like you. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> actually, I'm glad to be here. And 
Of course, Christina. My oh my. Uh, I am so thankful to Adam for bringing you on the show back in season two. From there, four more guest appearances, including on three specials, and now a main panelist. I, I hope you didn't regret your decision. I did not. I love it. I love the discussions we have. Um, I've missed Jerome. It was great having him at the beginning, but Anna's yeah. been a great replacement. Um, I won't say I like her more, but yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, clearly, it's very evident that there's a nice bond between you two. Jerome, we of course uh, love you as well. Lastly, thank you to all those that believed in me from the start uh, and that have helped make season nine a reality. You know, mom, dad, Babushka, Laura, Elvira, Marsha, your support means the world to me. And of course, Without these next people, there would be no point to do the show. The fans, the fans that have watched our live shows, commented on our feeds, voted in our polls, followed us on social media, and have sent messages of support. Thank you. Without you, Season 9 would not have happened. This is the first time we're doing it outside of Ryerson. I, I didn't think that Season 9 would happen. But here we are, 10 episodes completed. So... That wraps up the the acknowledgments. Who knows if this is goodbye? I, I guess we'll have to wait until when or even if season 10 is announced. For now, I'm Elliot Rabin. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>